This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello, hello, cave dwellers. Welcome to the cave as we continue our restoration of this. It's the Radio Shack TRS-80, or at least that's a part of it. We got to know this machine quite well in part one. It was what was known as the Trinity in 1977, that first wave of home computers that was released, comprising of the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the Radio Shack TRS-80 here. So it really is a worthy computer of restoring. It has its place in history and it's a shame to see it in the state it's in today. Now we got to know the machine and we also got to know the problem that we have with it. Here's what it looked like. We've got lots of text scrolling down the screen there and it doesn't get any further than that. But it was a promising start. I was fully expecting this machine to be dead on arrival. So we've got something to work with. And this is our starting point for today. Let's grab our tools, dive in and see if we can get any more life out of the TRS-80 and continue our trash to treasure restoration. Let's take a look. Here's our machine then, all ready to be fixed or destroyed, depending on if the computer gods favor us today. A common failure on this machine is the keyboard ribbon, which can result in the symptoms we've been seeing. So in part one, we cut the cable and that made no difference. Regardless of the outcome, we would have wanted to replace the cable anyway to keep it in good working order, so that's exactly where we're going to start. The old cable is soldered directly onto the board, so job one is to desolder each of the pins and pull them out one by one. The TRS-80 Model 1, as it turns out, is quite a nice machine to work on. The traces are thick and easy to follow, and a little flux paste got the old solder molten easily without too much trouble. The only close call I had was with pad 8 of this keyboard connector, which you may be able to see has lifted slightly. But no lasting damage was done, I was able to stick that back down, and the rest of the pins were slow, but fairly painless. With all the pins removed from the system board and it cleaned up and prepped, we'll do the same with the keyboard end, applying flux paste liberally and then working along pin by pin to free up the old cable. It seems kind of odd by modern standards to use a fairly stiff, fixed cable for the keyboard, but this wasn't uncommon for the period. Remember the TRS-80 was built very cheaply and every connector counted. I'm going to rectify that today by installing a row of header pins on each board so that we can plug and unplug a keyboard cable quickly and easily. So with both ends prepared, it's time to fit the new connectors, which look like this. A single row of 20 pins which push straight through the board, ready to be soldered on. 
If you're doing this yourself, just double check the header is flush to the board before and also during soldering so you don't get any nasty surprises when you flip the board back over and for example find it's floating a few millimetres above the board. One of the holes wasn't quite clear enough for this pin, so I've just applied a bit of heat to the solder while pushing the pin down to fix that up. A little IPA and a cleanup, and that doesn't look too bad at all to me. I do have one concern though, with the header and the new cable, will it all still fit inside the case? I guess we'll find out, but my main concern for now is getting the machine into a working state, case or no case. We could for example use a right angled row of header pins, and if it comes to that we can swap it out. So exactly the same process again, we'll solder our header in, give it a clean up, and then we're ready for testing. and I'm pretty happy with how those look. To connect them together, a nice short 20 pin cable would be ideal, which I don't have to hand, so for testing I'm just using a regular old IDE cable for now. That's a 40 pin cable with two rows of 20, so we're just plugging in one row. So it all looks nice, but what's the result of that work? Well, if I turn it on, we can see our problem is still present, but we do have a jolly nice removable keyboard cable. So we've got that going for us. Keyboard eliminated then, let's move on to the system board itself. Many of the chips on this board are socketed including the BIOS, CPU and memory chips, so given they offer us a path of least resistance in terms of desoldering, if replacement is needed it seems sensible to start with these to see if we can find a problem and I'm going to start off with the memory chips. There are 8 memory chips in total all lined up here and labelled from Z13 to Z20 on the board. They're all 804-0016 chips, making this 16K TRS-80 as opposed to the original model which had 4K. There's a few things we can look for to identify if we have a bad RAM chip. The first thing I did was to check that they're all showing signs of life by checking for power on the multimeter. Just working along each of the 8 chips, checking for voltage on the corresponding pins. And sure enough, they all seem fine, there's not an obvious dead chip in terms of power supply going to them. The next thing we can then check is that there's activity on the address lines, as well as the CAS and RAS pins. RAM is organised into rows and columns. When data is needed, the CPU activates the RAS, that's row access strobe line, to specify the row where the data is to be found, and the CAS or column access strobe to specify the column. So. If we're seeing a chip with no activity on the RAS or CAS pins, or nothing on the address line pins, it may help us to identify a faulty chip. Using my scope, I checked each of the chips, and on the face of it, once again, everything checked out. There was nothing unusual, there was nothing standing out on any individual chip that looked different from this high level view that we're checking them at. So I did one final check with the memory chips, and you may have been thinking, why didn't you just do this from the start? but it's always nice to show a problem conclusively if you can. And yes, it's to just swap out the memory chips. The 804-0016 chips aren't uncommon, and I happen to have some spares. So, one by one, I swapped out the memory chips to see if it might make the slightest bit of difference. It 
And you know what? Four chips in, everything changed. Instead of garbage down the screen, our TRS-80 is now prompting correctly for us to input the memory size. We don't input anything and we just hit enter to indicate we want to use all of the available memory and we're at our ready prompt. Suddenly, things are really looking up for this little machine. Our keyboard even appears to be working, look at those lovely letters appearing on the screen. But it's not quite all as easy as that. I soon discovered we have three keys which aren't working. U, N and 4, on the numpad that is. So we turn our attention back to the keyboard now. Rather helpfully, if we look at the rear of the keyboard, all of the switches are labelled so we can easily identify which is the N switch, for example, which is causing us problems. Now we can follow the traces to check for continuity and make sure there aren't any breaks, but there's a much easier test, which will immediately tell us if the problem is with the key switch itself or if it's further in the system. And that's to simply short the two legs of any one key switch. Shorten them out closes the circuit and should register a key press, so if it does, we know the problem is within the switch mechanism itself. So I'm just shorting them out with a screwdriver and checking the screen our letters appear for all three of those keys. So the problem is clearly with the switches. That's a good thing, they're not too complicated as we'll find out. Failing key switches are often caused by dirt obstructing the mechanism, so my first approach is a squirt of contact cleaner, which we just work into the switch as much as we can. The switches are soldered onto the board itself, so if we can avoid having to desolder them, that's a good time saver for us. So, after a squirt of contact cleaner and a bash, our N key is now working, hurrah! Likewise, our 4 key came to life using the same method, but our U key is very persistent and still refuses to play with us. So we're going to have to take that switch off the board and take a look inside to see what the problem is. Both legs there, a little stubborn to desolder but we got them out eventually. I really must get a desoldering tool with a vacuum pump on one day soon, it would make these little jobs much easier. With the legs desoldered, to lift the switches out I find an IC removal tool very handy. With its flat ends you can just push them flush with the board, give it a squeeze and then work the switch out with a screwdriver. And then to get inside the switch we can just flick the sides off with a craft knife, allowing our components to spew out from the inside of the switch. Now while it's more complex than a simple membrane keyboard, it is still relatively simple in its operation. The two legs need to be connected together to close the circuit and register a key press. And that's achieved by pressing horizontally against this plate with another piece of conductive material which hooks over the top here, that's the silver piece. So when those two are touching, the circuit is closed. A plunger sits on a return spring and it's the edge of this that rubs against the silver plate to push it back. What seems to be the problem here is that there's not enough contact between the plunger and the plate. I'm sure there's a technical term for the plunger but you understand which component I'm talking about, the little plastic piece that the keycap sits on. So I'm just going to bend it out a bit in the middle so it makes contact with the plunger and then bend those legs back a little bit so that it kicks back onto the other metal plate. We can then put it all back together and check for continuity on the multimeter. I really must get some smaller crocodile clips for this kind of job. But the test is successful. When we press the button, we get a closed circuit every time, so we should be good to go with this key. And as we've desoldered it, I might as well give it a quick clean inside with some contact cleaner as well. So we'll give that a quick squirt and then we'll solder it back into place for testing. We 
Where do I stand now then? Let's plug it in. And... Yes, our Yuki has joined the party. We now have a full complement of working keys and what appears to be a fully operational TRS-80. We obviously haven't checked the expansion connector or cassette tape input for example, but it's looking good. We're still a long way from being finished on this project, but we have taken a big leap in solving the problems it arrived with. Even if it doesn't yet fit back in the case, I've, I've got a shorter cable on order, so we can hopefully solve that problem. But I can tell you that those ALP keyboard switches sure do sound good, just have a listen to these. And just to prove that a keyboard cable can be a problem with the TRS-80, let me show you what happens if we power it up without the keyboard connected. So you see it's not so different from the symptoms that we had before, although we did briefly see the mem size prompt pop up on the screen there before all of the rubbish scrolled down the screen. So yes, a properly connected keyboard and cable are essential in getting this machine to boot up. Let's go back and talk to the beardy man at the table. Well, we've certainly got a happier TRS-80 now, haven't we? And I'm happy to push on with the restoration process now. Moving on to the next stage, which will be to give it a full recap because the capacitors on that board could be as old as I think that board's about 1982, 83, looking at the dates on the chips. So they're well worth replacing, even though they're not leaking yet. A bit of preventative maintenance will go a long way. Uh, we also need to clean it up a little bit. And then there's some restoration work to be done on the case itself. It's worn along the front where the user's wrist was rubbing against it. And I think that's probably quite a common thing that you'll see on a lot of TRS-80s. There's a bit, few bits of plastic missing where they've chipped off around the side. And that goes for the expansion interface as well. We may need to do a little bit of restoration on that if we can get it working. And um, we'll also be bringing some 3D printing into the process in the next episode because there's some little plastic spaces that sit between the system board and the keyboard and they've perished just through age. They're just very, very brittle. And I think they'll be a really easy piece to 3D print with the help of Howard over at Dubious Engineering. He's recently got himself a 3D printer. So we'll make six or so of these little spaces with a 3D printer. And if they work well, maybe we'll make a few extra packets to help out some other TRS-80 owners who want to fit those parts in their computer as well. So I hope you'll join me in episode three for all that and more, and subsequent episodes where we need to demonstrate the system. We need to use the disk drives, which probably need some maintenance as well. I'm sure the drive belts or other components within them need a bit of servicing before we can use them. There's that whopping big expansion interface we need to look at. And, well, so much more, we just need to see what the system's capable of. What can we do with a 1977 microcomputer? We'll find out. I hope you'll join me, and I'll see you then. Take care. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting the channel using the links in the description or simply subscribe and come back for more soon.